All right. How many people are done with the five and six? How many people are done with the five? Okay, I guess enough of you are done with the five. Let me go through five because this is the one where um, there's a kind of, um, there's a mathematical language here that once you learn it, it becomes very elegant and simple way to work it out. But when you don't know it, it's like being in a foreign country and your vocabulary doesn't include whatever words they are using. It's like, uh, yeah, uh, I, I guess the, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't have good analogies in mind. So let me just uh, write it out in a way that um, kind of expands out what's uh, hidden in this kind of compact notation. I have done the first step here, but let me do a few more so that it's all kind of spelled out for everyone to see. So we are trying to calculate S squared operator. And the word operator gives, well, once you know the language, it gives you a hint that you are looking for square matrix. Because in the, the way we are working, our representation of operator is a square matrix. All right? So let me do a few more um, algebra notations. But this S squared means, as I wrote down there, it means S dot product with S. You know what? Let me just be extra careful and go one more step. Um, this vector S, this is how you can represent it. You can represent it as um, in the uh, unit vector form. So the x component times x hat. Actually, uh, let me uh, swap the order so that there's no confusion here. x hat times the x component plus y hat times y component plus g hat times g component um, times that product with x hat times x component plus y hat times y component plus g hat times g component. Good. Uh, I want you to write it out this way because this is a chance to kind of clarify two different kinds of vectors we are using. <laughs> um, so these are unit vectors, right? That you already know. Um, any guesses how these unit vectors relate to these vectors we've been talking about? It's a trick question. The answer is not at all. They are two different kinds of vectors entirely. This is a state vector that's a physical three-dimensional vector, direction vector. Um, that's why I hesitated on calling this a vector. Because when you call it spinner, then you make it clear that this is an entirely different mathematical object from vectors that's like arrows that point in different three-dimensional space. This state vector is a, it's a linear algebra vector. It's an abstract vector, a linear vector space vector. Yeah? So is that SX operator? Does that give you the state or does that give you the direction? It's an operator. It's something to act on a vector width. But until you act on a vector with that, you don't actually have anything. But like what, what does it return? Does it return a state or does it return a... Yeah. When you multiply a square matrix to a column vector, you get a column vector back. Right? Mm -hmm. So you get a state back. Yeah, oh, but yeah, so when you act on, yeah, yeah I think, let's leave it there, good? <laughs> and if you wanted to measure this, actually, so here I'm kind of um, omitting uh, something as a matter of convention. So all this, this is an operator algebra, and you know, this is more of an upper diameter. It's uh, easy to make a mistake on operator algebra because this whole operator object, they're different from functions and other things, numbers that you may have been dealing with. Um, the advice I was given when I was taking linear algebra or whatever is that to make sure that you don't make any mistake in the operator algebra, always imagine that you are acting on a state with that operator. Imagine that you are acting on a particular state with that operator. You are acting on a particular state with these operators. So with all this, Imagine you are acting on a particular state. And whatever steps you go through, make sure you are not doing anything that's mathematically disallowed. And at the very end, ignore these states, then you will have done correct operator algebra. 
Yep. All right, so let's uh, go through the rest. So um, I'm actually, so the reason I'm kind of doing um, this is, this notation hides a lot of um, uh, complexity that could potentially be there because the, you know, the notations and rules of, uh, rules of algebra that you've been taught since um, middle school? No, algebra. Um, sorry. My go toward is kindergarten, and I know that's wrong for algebra. Elementary school, uh, PEMDAS, or whatever. Those rules, they apply to graduate level abstract math. Um, they teach you from below because all those rules about distri uh, distributive law, associated property, they continue to hold with this new mathematical object. So, um, so I'm just gonna use that. The one thing I'm gonna be careful with is when you're dealing with the operators, they are potentially non-commutative. So I am going to be very careful when I swap the order of any product, just in case whatever I'm dealing with are non-commutative. So other than that, let me just go through it. So I guess um, it's kind of easier to just kind of write it out. Um, so I have, all right, let's, um, um, okay, I don't wanna write out the whole thing. Um, so let me just uh, highlight this and then I want to um, write out the whole thing. So I have this, when I distribute this product, when I expand out this uh, multiplication, I have this thing multiplying to this, 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 right? So potentially, let me write down the first one. I have x hat dot sx times x hat times sx. Okay? And I guess the key thing that's important to here is this dot product. So let me just highlight that dot product. I just mentioned that how these products are potentially non-commutative, so I would be careful about swapping any order. So this is what I would ask. Well, how does this x hat vector interact with this operator? Do they interact with each other at all? They live in completely separate space. What this vector represents and what the operator represents is like two orthogonal things. They don't affect each other. So this is where I'm gonna just find, well, I can actually move this past this operator. And I have this dot product. And actually this dot product was meant to be for three dimensional space vectors. So I have x dot x, that's one, right? Okay, so I have, so simplifying that, I have sx matrix product with sx. That's it. And when you look at these other two products, x dot y gives you zero x dot z gives you zero again. So, and when you go through that for all these three terms, what you end with is what many of you probably used, just intuitively. Sy, Sy, plus Sg, Sg. So if you did that intuitively, great. In this case, there was no mistake. Um, the reason I wanted to work through this in detail was sometimes with the new notations, um, if your intuition continues to work great, but if not, you need to be able to kind of uh, unpack the notation, work it out step by step, and then do it. Um, all right, so let me just uh, do this calculation then. So I need to calculate this, which would be, let me just do the coefficient on its own, h bar squared. So when I do this, I get h bar squared over four times, uh, so I have to, uh, I guess I should write it out. Um, so, 0, 1, 1, 0, multiply to 0, 1, 1, 0. All right, let's work it out and see what I get. h bar over 4, um, this times this. That's 1, right? Yeah. yeah, visually, by the way, that's what I do. I imagine going across as I go down. That kind of is a quick visual way to. So this times this is 0, right? 0, 1, 1, 0. This times this, oh, so let me write down that 0. This times this is zero again, so zero. And this times this is one. All right, this is an identity matrix multiplied to a scalar. I guess in terms of operators, this is as close to a scalar as you can come. Because a scalar times identity matrix, you can multiply it to anything else that has the right dimensions and you'll just get essentially scalar multiplication. Uh, let's do this. Actually, uh, everyone has done this. Did you get this exact same thing for each one of these? 
Yes? Not everyone? Raise your hand if you got this thing for this and this. Well, let me, okay, let me go through it, yeah. All right, so when you do this, all right, so you get uh, this, this factor twice again, h bar squared over four times, let me write this out, zero minus i, i zero times zero minus i, i zero. All right, so, um, uh, that, so that's equal to h bar, uh, mix some back now, four, this times this. Minus i times i, what does that give you? Negative i squared. Uh, i is the imaginary number. What is i squared? Negative one. So negative i squared is one. Yeah, so it's just still one. Yeah. Okay, so this times, uh, wait, wait, wait. That. Okay, so this times that is zero again. So zero. This times this is zero again. And this times this is, once again, one. Yeah. So, oh, so it, they end up being the same. And when you do SCG squared, you also end up getting the same thing as this. So the overall result is h bar squared, oh, sorry, uh, is equal to three h bar squared over four times the identity matrix. And this actually agrees with something that you are told on Tuesday. With the, with the quantum numbers on Tuesday, this is what you are told. Uh, let me just uh, write down. Um, so remember the L quantum number, right? L quantum number goes from 0, 1, 2, whatever. And we said this is the angular momentum quantum number. And we said this is related to the magnitude of angular momentum and that the magnitude of angular momentum is equal to h bar times square root of l times l plus one. That ring a bell? Yes? Now, let's just imagine that this relationship for angular momentum continue to apply to the spin angular momentum. Then you would say, okay, magnitude, spin squared should be h bar squared times, get rid of the square root, the quantum number s times, oops, uh, quantum number s times s plus one. So s is one half in our case. Is this s three over four? Is that s times s plus one? One half times one half plus one, three halves, yeah. Yeah, so that's it. So I mean, I, I, this doesn't prove anything, but it shows that the rules that spin angular momentum satisfies is um, same as the rules that the orbital angular momentum satisfies. Um, and you, can, you, kind of, you saw it rigorously. So in, um, when we did this, I, we just gave you the rule. You didn't drive this anywhere. But with the matrix mechanics, you can see rigorously that yes, this is the eigenvalue. This is the actual measurement of the angular momentum magnitude squared. 